the truth is so powerful and so life-changing. And we should let it change us. We should allow the word of God to change us. You know, the way that God works is from the inside out. The way that men and women works is from the outside in. That stuff doesn't quite work the outside in. Because what's inside of you is going to stay the same. But God works from the inside out. I've been uh, thinking about uh, the idea of what is Christianity and how does Christianity advance? What is Christianity? Like, what is it really? And so some people think that Christianity is a religion or a system of truth or a moral and ethical doctrine that can somehow stimulate us to great philanthropic impulses. But such a, but such a stimulus is only temporary in the teetering or bankrupt economy of Christian living. Those types of stimuluses don't really work in the long run. Or you might say, what is Christianity? Sometimes people think it's, it's an expression of the soul of man. The soul of man has much in it. So sometimes what do people put their trust in? They put their trust in anything that has a technical grasp of doctrine, lots of activity, and the power of natural wisdom and ability, or they put their trust in clever manipulation and interesting presentations of Christian uh, content and themes. All of this comes from the natural life, which brings nobody any lasting benefit. And those who live that way ultimately have a life that is useless for those around them. Useless for lasting ends, that is. What do you have to know when it comes to Christianity and how to advance it? We cannot argue people, reason people, fascinate them, interest them, use emotional appeal or passionate enthusiasm to get them into the kingdom of heaven. None of that's going to work. We cannot rely on great intellect and knowledge by itself to bring about the new birth. Right. That is not what it is by itself. It is only when, so I'm shifting between what it is and isn't, I'm kind of going back and forth. It is only when our human spirit is in union with the Holy Spirit that anything of true value can be brought to birth. Is your human spirit in union with the Holy Spirit? I'm not saying, are you a soulless Christian, charged up, good-looking, big bank account, lots of popularity, clever phrases, and you can now talk others because you wag your tongue. That's not what I'm talking about. Is your spirit in union with the Holy Spirit? Where is this idea found? John 6, verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. That is what matters. So God takes great pains in the whole Bible to teach this lesson. What is the lesson? Spiritual ends demand spiritual means. A spiritual end, a spiritual result must use a spiritual means to get it. That is why so many Christian works go up in flames in frustration, bitterness, jealousies, division, bankruptcy. Even. Spiritual ends demand spiritual means. Will we humble ourselves as a little child for the spirit of God to use us to do a truly spiritual work? What is Christianity? What is Christianity? It is ultimately a revelation or it is nothing. It is ultimately a revelation, or it is nothing of lasting value. Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, Paul said this, verse 11, For, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. 
Mm-hmm. For neither received, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't from man or according to man. It is ultimately a revelation, or it is nothing of any use to the planet. We get so confused, so frustrated, so disappointed, even bitter about our mission, our field, our clientele, our congregation, which leads to jealousies, rivalries, bitterness, and many other works of the flesh. It is very hard for the natural man in us to do nothing in advancing the Christian faith. It is even like crucifixion for ourselves, so to speak. We must empty ourselves of all our trust in our self-resources for God to finally start using us. And how long will it take you to be emptied of trust in your self-resources? Hopefully, you do it when you're a child. If you miss it, you got round two as a young adult. If you miss it, you got round three, but don't miss it. If you've missed it already, stop missing it. God so wants to use us, but he can't use the natural man in us. He is going to use the the new man made after the image and likeness of God. Will we finally learn the the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man, between the soul-centered man and the man in which the human spirit renewed in his image and likeness finally has dominion? over the soul and spirit, over the soul and body in you. How long will it take? What are you waiting for? What really matters to us? And what is Christianity? God bless you on that. Just wanted to start with that to begin our Bible study tonight. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go ahead and share our outlines from the chapter. Uh, We do something called chapter summary. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the scripture saying to know what it means? Well, we know what it means. We'll know what we have to do about it. But first, what is it saying? So outlines of the chapter. Verses 1 through 4, repeated sacrifices. Don't take away sin. Uh, Verses 5 through 10, we are made holy through Christ. Verses 11 through 14, we are made perfect through Christ. Verses 15 through 25, we need to have faith in Jesus. Yes, amen. Verses 1 to 9, the law is like the shadow. Verses 10 to 18, Jesus saved us from our sins. Verses 19 to 25, because of Jesus, we can go to heaven. Okay. Go to heaven right now, by the way. Yes, right now, by the way, don't delay. (laughs) Go into that most holy place. One through nine, sacrifices and burnt offerings are not what God desires. 10 through 14, Jesus Christ is the one sacrifice that covers our sins. 15 through 22, we can draw near to God through, through the blood. And 23 to 25, let us hold fast in our hope by loving one another. I like that. Let us hold fast in our hope by loving each other. That's how you show your hope. Not my jib, jab, and chit chat, but by loving each other. You can't chit chat, by the way, (laughs) but by loving each other in very practical ways. One to four, perfection does not come through animal blood. Five to ten, it came through Jesus' death. Eleven to eighteen, after offering the perfect sacrifice, Christ is seated at the at the throne of God. Nineteen to twenty-five. Now we can enter boldly to the holiest place. Okay. So I called it sum up. Anyways, verses one through seven, the old law inadequate. Eight through ten, holy through Christ. 11 through 18, no longer any sacrifice for sin. 19 through 23, so let us now draw near to God. 
dot, 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 verses 24 to 25, and to one another in Christ. Draw near to God and to one another. They always go together. Mm. They always go together. Let us live that dual life simultaneously all the time. Yes. Amen. Excellent. One to six, insufficiency of the sacrifices and offerings. Seven to 14, the sacrifice of Christ perfectly accomplishes God's will. 15 to 18, witness of the Holy Spirit. 19 to 22, drawing near to our great high priest without hindrance. And 23 to 25, application for our lives in God's house. Verse one, the law is the shadow. Number one is the shadow. Uh, it's just an image and can never be perfect. Uh, verses um, 6 to 11, Christ, through the offering of his body and blood, came into the world. Number one, as a sacrifice and offering. Number two, to do God's will. Number three, to take away the first and establish the second. Number four, through the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11, um, comparison, uh, the priest and Jesus Christ. Priest, a uh, daily offering and sacrifice, but can never take away sin. Verses 12 to 14, Jesus, um, um, number one, offered sacrifice for sins. This is 12 to 14. Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, oh, uh, victorious over his enemies. And number four, we are sanctified and perfected. Verses 15 to 17, through the Holy Ghost, the Lord will put his laws into our hearts and our minds. Um, verse 18 to 19, because of the remission of our sins and the blood of Jesus, we can boldly enter into the holiest of holies. That's number one. This is verses 18 to 21. Uh, we can boldly enter into the holiest of holies. We have a consecrated life because we, by passing through the veil. And three, we have a high priest over the house of God. Verses 22 to 23, let us, with a true heart, um, have full assurance of faith without wavering, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and that bodies washed with pure water. And verse 24, let us, 24 to 25, let us, number one, consider one another to, to provoke one another unto love and to good works. Three, assemble ourselves together for exhort one another as we see the day approaching. So, you know, that assembling together, it doesn't matter how many, the outcome should always be the same. doesn't matter how big or small. The outcome is what matters. What results from the gathering, not the size, not the wealth, not the demographics, yeah. but the result. Yeah. That's what the Lord is looking at. That's what we should look at too, by the way. Some people make a big deal of noise or music or stimulation or whatever. I say the big deal is the result. Love and good works. Mm, that is what really matters about any Christian gathering anywhere, day or night, yeah. home or a hall, wherever you are. Uh, but did anyone have a puzzling question or something that's keeping you from understanding the chapter? Anyone in here? So why does the Holy Spirit have to be a witness to us? What's the purpose of that verse? That's a great question. Why does the Holy Spirit have to be a witness? Well, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three are working to one end. So the three are reinforcing each other, you might say. The three are in perfect unity. The Father commands... The Son acts. The Spirit, you might say, proclaims what the Son does. It's always perfectly in harmony. That's a part of the answer there. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question on verse 22, where it says, Let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Um, the wash with pure water is the question I have, because... We've been talking about the blood and um, when the sacrifices and, you know, have to be sprinkled. 
but I, the, what's the reference of the wash with pure water? Great question. I think the reference ha has to do with this because the context is drawing into the, um, into the holy place, right? Verse 19. Uh, yeah, into the holiest, yeah, to enter the holiest. So he's saying, how can you enter the holiest? So here's what we got to know. Sometimes what we think is a quality Christian life is not what God thinks is a quality Christian life. Hmm. We have an idea, we have a profile, we have an image. That person must be quality, ah, that person can't. We have ways of looking at each other, right, in an external way. What is the Lord, what is, what are his, what is he looking at if someone's going to come in? He's looking at the inner life of the Christian and the outer life. He's looking at both. And he's looking for harmony. He's looking for um, the, the, the inner and the outer to mesh together. So when you have the, uh, so there's an image of blood and there's an image of water. Now, you've got to ask this. This is like just knowing good analytical criticism. If the blood is, is um, obviously not literal, like you don't get literal blood, right? You don't get a test tube and throw it on your body. You know, just throw a test tube. It is, it is uh, representing a spiritual reality. Hmm. So if the blood represents a spirituality, the water, likewise, represents a spiritual reality. They're both spiritual. Because I've heard some people say, oh, you see, water baptism this, water baptism that. There are some people who, bound that, who pound that drum about water baptism. Water baptism has a place, but not about getting into the whole, holiest of all. So what, what's he talking about? I believe he's, he's talking about this, that the blood of Christ cleanses your inner life so that you can draw near, um, see your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. That is all of the guilt you are so guilty of. And we are so guilty of our guilt. Let's not fake it and think we're not bad people. We are bad. But the blood of Christ cleanses us from an evil conscience. That is the obsession and the memory of it, you might even say. The blood cleanses because his blood takes away all unrighteousness. The blood of Christ does that in the inner man. So if the inner man at the, at the fountain is cleansed, the outer man must also be cleansed too. How? The Holy Spirit, God gives us his Holy Spirit to cleanse our daily walk. That is the water washing the body. Because the body is your externals, right? What you're actually doing. What you're actually doing. So we need the spirit of God to cleanse our daily walk along with the blood of Christ cleansing our inner life at the same time to really enjoy access to the holiest. So you could be in a Christian church, right? You got so-and-so person saying this and saying that so-and-so person at the microphone. They sound really spiritual. But if they're hypocritical, that is in their private life, they're sitting against God. They're walking disobedience, they're covetous, they're jealous, they're bitter. They're not in the holiest, no matter what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But you could have some uh, poor, down and out, minimum wage Christian, <laughs> the back row, trying to say, right? Trying to make a contrast. And by the way, minimum wage is pretty high where we live, so it's not that. Right. But nonetheless, it's some minimum wage. You know, Santa, right? But you could have some poor, down and out person who is trusting in the blood of Christ. And doing what they can to walk in the spirit. You know, they're not like impressive and whatever, but they're walking with God how they can. That person's in the holiest. Right. The other person not. So the water is going to be the spirit cleansed daily walk of the believer. That's what I think. I just wanted to support what you were saying. I, the Lord brought that verse to me that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the of water by the word so it's it's the spirit of god using the word but that's that you know well, that's that washing that's that water yeah exactly yeah in in our daily behavior so like we're not stealing from our boss we're not insulting our siblings 
We're not, um, uh, you know, um, leaving our home trashy and messy because we're too um, empty headed to think of other people, whatever it is, right? Our behavior is changed so that in the daily walk, we're actually walking with God. So yes. Um, so I was wondering what in verse 23, when it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What is the hope that it's talking about? In a, in a nutshell, the, the, the hope, the confidence, or it says the confidence of our hope. So what God has promised in Jesus Christ, he will do. Mm -hmm. He will do what he's mm -hmm. promised in his son. We are so full of hope for that. Mm -hmm. By the way, not so much confidence in the Federal Reserve, okay? <laughs> I don't have that much confidence in the Federal Reserve. I don't have that much confidence in cultural icons. Don't have that much confidence. In but I have confidence in the Heavenly Father and the faithfulness of God. Yes, that is a confidence of my hope. My title is What Really Matters. That's what I want to talk about. What really matters. And it's so important to know in life what's really important. Do we know that? Do we have a renewed value system? Because what really matters is what really matters to God the Father. That's what really matters. That's what's really important. You know, that word really gets, gets used a lot. So I don't want to overuse it. But I just want to say, in a country like this, where there's so much, well, there's actually less and less freedom of speech. Used to be a lot more, a lot less now. But nonetheless, still some freedom of speech left in America. People are always saying what matters to them, and they are demonstrating what matters to them. But what matters to God? That is what I'm talking about tonight. And can we uh, let's see? Let's um, first John 2 15 through 17. Yeah, we're going to read that. Go ahead. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God abides for, or lives forever. Yes. The one who does the will of God abides forever, lives forever. What really matters is knowing and doing the will of God. That is what really matters. Not the lust of the flesh, not the lust of the eyes, not the boastful pride of life. Why? Because all that is temporary. It's passing away. And a lot of it's going to lake of fire, okay? It's going into that e eternal incinerator. <laughs> That's where that stuff's going. But what will abide? What will last? The person who does the will of God. That is what really matters. Are you that type of person? Are you that type of person? Let's do uh, the outline, please. From this chapter, let's look at the uh, one through four. Failing to reach the goal, five through seven, finding the perfect person. Hey, if everybody fails to reach the goal, can anybody do it? There is one person who can. There's only one, though, by the way. You got to find that person. Um, eight, uh, the next six, eight through ten, taking away and making a way. This is what the perfect person is going to do. Taking away and making a way. And you know, he does it perfectly, by the way. Next part. Sitting and waiting for final victory. Because after this perfect person has done his work, he's sitting and he's waiting. He's waiting for something to happen. And by the way, it's 100% certain there, there, will be, there will be a final victory. Yeah. Next section. Witnessing to his perfect covenant. So alongside, um, so you might say this, um, verses one, one through four is the nation of Israel failing. Five through seven is the father finding the perfect person. The next two sections are the son, what the son does, the son of God. 
15 through 18 is the spirit witnessing to the perfect covenant. So you see there's failure and then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come forth. And now what's next? Next, next section. What now? So if all this has happened, what now? What do we do right now? Let's see. It's the next part. We use our rights and privileges. Verses 19, actually 19 through 21. 19 through 21, use our rights and privileges. Next one. Verse 22, how do we use it? We use it in faith. Next one. In hope. Next one. In love. Faith, hope, and love. Abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. That's what really matters. Faith, hope, and love. But I would say to us, will we get that far where faith, hope, and love is really operating? Let's see. We got to answer the first question, what really matters? So my, my main verse is from verses 9 and 10. It's, I'm turning it back to Hebrews 10. Uh, and we can um, go ahead and stop sharing screen. Thanks. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 9 says, Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So let me just walk this through for 10 minutes as intensely and humanly possible. <laughs> because, and then we got to pause because uh, I want to hear the questions. What is it that the son came to do? He came to do this. He came to answer a prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because what had been interjected into the kingdom of God, rebellion, disobedience, destruction, devastation, and a part of it, by the way, not the whole, but in a part of it, where we are. And so in that part, the son has come to do what? That God's will would be done on earth just as perfectly as it's done in heaven. Heaven and earth merge together in one blessed sphere. As a Revelation 20, 21 and 22 uh, uh, tells us will happen. One world, you might say, where, where the will of God is done all the time. That's what he came to do. That's what really matters is the will of God. That's why he came to affect that. And by the way, his will is going to steamroll over everybody else. I don't want to be under that steamroll when it comes through. I want to be with Christ in heavenly places. I don't want to be under that. You can be. Where do you want to be, by the way? Where do you choose to be? Where do your friends choose to be? If you have friends who want to be into the steamroller, get new friends. Get new friends because I don't want to have their mindset about what life is all about. I want to have the mindset of the heavenly overcomers who really are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. They are priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So what really matters in America today? Politics, sports, money, coffee and pastries, <laughs> pleasure. Now, coffee's pretty good, okay? What really matters, I said, right? What really matters? Pleasure, exercise, diet, monastic living, indulgent living, women's rights, men's rights, Home mortgage? Anyone? What really matters? What is it that really matters? People live what really matters. And you could see it. Matthew 7, 16. You shall know them by their fruits. How are people really living? Not what are they saying. How are people really living? So what are we having here in, in this chapter 10, verses 1 to 25? We're having the end of a long argument in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 4, verse 14, we commence with knowing about our great high priest. So from chapter 4, verse 14 to chapter 10, verse 18, there's been an ongoing presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ, his identity, his work, his sacrifice, and his sanctuary. That's what we've been learning about. It's coming to an end in verse 18, and then 19 rolls into something really epic and good, too. 
Scriptures always get greater, by the way. It always gets greater. But that's what we've been in. So what's happening in chapter 10, 1 through 18? Ideas are being repeated. But you might say, hey, didn't he say that already? What is the what is the myth? What is the only method of learning that really matters? Repetition. Repetition is what matters. For instance, we have so many kids, right? And we say, hey, kids, so and so, um, be sure to clean your plate after lunch. And so we say that, right? It's stated more than once. And you know, day comes on, sunset, sunrise, next day comes. What's in the sink? An unwashed plate. How did that happen? How could that have happened? <laughs> and so you could say, wait, didn't I tell you yesterday? Yes, Papa Mama Bear, you told me yesterday. <laughs> but why isn't it done? So the holy, so the, the parents work by repetition. By repetition. Well, why are you telling me so and so child says? Because you're not doing it. The parents thought. <laughs> well, why aren't you doing it? Uh, the child says, oh, Aren't I perfect? Aren't I the perfect child? Well, would to God we all would be, right? <laughs> so, and yet we all have something to learn. We all do have something to learn, right? We, we all do. Oh. And so repetition is needed. And so verses one through four, what are we talking about here? We're talking about failure in verses one to four, failing to reach the goal. And so what is the goal that's being failed? What is the goal that God wants us all to reach? Hebrews 10 verse one. For the law having to shadow the good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. That's the goal. Perfect. What is your goal? Good enough. What is your goal? Look good. What is your goal? Fake out my parents. Oh, wait. No, no. Those kids must not exist. No, they don't exist. They only exist in hypothetical. No, do they exist? Fake out the parents the goal? Is that it? What is the goal with God? Perfection. Perfection. That is his goal. What you think and what you do are perfectly lined up to what the Father wants. And so what did the religion of Israel fail to do? It failed to make those who approach perfect. It failed it. And so what is the religion of Israel, that first system? It is the most perfect religion you could ever have because God did it. Right. God made it, right? It wasn't Moses making it up. It was all a pattern from above given to him. And in that religion, you could say, in that religion, what could men do that could please a father? It's, it's given in that religion. And so what you have here is you have people... Um, Falling short. And what are the methods? It says sacrifices continually year by year. Verse verse one, right? Year by year. So there's ceremony, there's holidays, there's sacrifices, there's rituals, there's formalities, there's special priests. That's the method. The method fails. It fails. Because it says here, it can never, with these same sacrifices, verse one, never. It's never doing it, friends. Never. And he says there in verse 2, if it would have worked, you would have stopped doing it. You would have stopped off the sacrifices. Verse 2. But if for the worshipers once purified, would have had no more conscience of sins. Every year in that Judaistic religion, they knew they were guilty. They were conscious of it. They knew where they were guilty. It was only a covering. It was temporary. Those 14 centuries from Moses to the time of Christ, temporary time, but they had consciousness of sins. Verse three, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. How would you like it if your father reminded you year by year of all your failures? Not very encouraging, right? If year by year, or your own heart reminds you, right? Your own heart reminds you, or something reminds you year by year. You might say, how can I escape? The reminder, it's not working. 
For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. No human religion can do it. So if you have the best one that couldn't do it, surely the copycats can't either. It's impossible. So what is it? Verses five through seven. Um, finding the perfect one. So God the Father is going to find someone to do what that religion couldn't do, five through seven. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, so this is really good. When he came in the world, have you ever seen like a Broadway play and the stage is empty, right? And then the, the star comes onto the stage and there's a star in the play. Yeah, there's a star in this, and all the lights are on that person. This is kind of like what's happening here. All the other actors and actresses failed. Get them off the stage for a minute. Someone enters into the stage of world history. They appear. He appears. The word becomes flesh. When he came into the world, finally someone's here. Finally someone. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So this is Psalm 40. David writes it around 1000 B.C., Moses had, the, had his law and system in place 1,400 or so. Only 400 years into it, God is already saying through David, I don't want this. I don't desire this. This doesn't make me happy. There's no pleasure in it in this. But people are doing it. Have you ever seen things that people do year after year that God has no pleasure in? But they think God has pleasure in it. That's, that's the tug of war here that he's talking about. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. So it says a body you have prepared for me. So instead of a religious system, do this, don't do that. Seven days you go to the Feast of Booths and then this and then that. Let's put all that aside and a body has come. The Lord Jesus in the body came to us, prepared to do the will of the Father. That's what God prepared, a person. Not a system, but a person. The person has come. And so the person, um, it says here, verse 7, Behold, I have come, the Bible of the book is written to me to do your will, O God. You know what's so interesting when you have an author who writes something? Only the author has the liberty to change the words of what he writes. And so way back in 1000 BC or so, the Holy Spirit used David to say some things. And now again, that same author a thousand years later is going to rearrange it slightly differently. Because in Psalm 40, it says, uh, in the volume of the book is written to me, to do your will, O God, thy law was, is within my heart. So in this quotation, the Holy Spirit's selectively taking something to make an emphasis. Let the Spirit of God apply the Word of God with his emphasis to us. Let him. And so why can the Son do the will of the Father? Remember the Gospels from the Jordan to Golgotha, right? The waters of Jordan to Golgotha. He's always doing the will of the Father. He did it before, by the way. We're just talking about the three and a half years. Why could he always, like, Talk to the leper, heal the leper, uh, raise a person from the dead, um, you know, um, preach the gospel to the poor. But every single minute, talking to disciples, um, you know, staying up all night in prayer, right? All these things, right? Very specific things he did all the time. Eating a meal with tax gatherers, like the will of God. How could he do all these specifics perfectly? Because the law of the Father was in his heart. Because the law of God is in your heart, you will not sin against him. If the law is in your heart. But Christian, do you want it in your heart? Do you want it? When his law is in your heart, see, when his law is in your heart, the details will come forth of the daily living. So the law of God does not say tomorrow on January 28th at 8 a.m., go and do so and so. It doesn't say that. I don't see it there. I'm <laughs> looking for it. It doesn't say the specifics of his will, but is it? But is his law in your heart? That's that's the that's why that's the perfect person. So he found a perfect person. 
Verses um, 11, uh, 8 through 10. The perfect person is going to do two ways. He's going to take away and make away. He's going to take away this. He's going to, it says here, um, he comes, verse 9. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first. What's the first? It's that whole system of religious formality, sacrifice, everything. Take it away. Haul it away. And bring the second. What is the second? The will of God. That's the second. So the new covenant does this. The new covenant enables every single person who enters into it to do the will of God. That's what the new covenant is doing. The new covenant brings you into a new life where the will of God is what matters. Not so much religious formality and, you know, performance and this and that. Now, there are things Christians do. God bless them for it. I'm not saying you don't do stuff. I'm just saying the essence of it is the will of God. That's the essence of the second. And then, so he's going to uh, take away the first, make a way into the will of God to the second. And then he's going to do one more thing. Well, let's add in the third. He's going to verse 10. Um, by the which will we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He is going to sanctify us perfectly, by the way. The Father will sanctify us through the Son's offering. The Son's offering is once for all. That is, it's done. Will you in this room enter into the purity that Jesus Christ wants to bring you into now? Will you do it now? Are you hanging on to some dirty idols? Let go of it. So he wants, so what does the Son want to, the Son wants to create a race of pure people who will do the will of God all the time. That's what the son is doing. The fa- I'm sorry. That's what the father is doing through the work of, of, of the son. He, he, he will sanctify. He says he has perfected forever, right? He's perfect forever. Those who are being sanctified. It is awesome. It is incredible. Let's go to the questions. I'll finish the second half. Let's go to our questions now. Um, from verse one, uh, explain the meaning of shadow. What is the problem with trusting in religious practices which are just a shadow? I'm going to try to answer this. Um, that a shadow is the obscure form and outline of the real thing. And so the object of the Israelites' faith was just a form and a shell without substance and detail. Mm. So it's been said that the Old Testament is a new, new Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so to me, that means that the New Testament reveals something that the Israelites only knew in shadows and types, Jesus Christ. And Jesus in the New Testament reveals that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the object of Ours and the Israelites' faith. Um, but the children of Israel did not yet have full knowledge of the truth and were under tutors of the law. Like it says in Galatians 3, yeah, 3.23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be just justified by faith. But after that, but after that faith is come, we're no longer under schoolmaster. And then it also says before that, in verse 12, and the law is not, not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Mm. Um, so anyway, it might get confusing, but um, that's good. That's the good. problem with trusting in religious practices is those who live by religious practices must follow it perfectly. Mm. But in our flesh, that's not possible. And so therefore, if we hold to those religious practices, we are under condemnation and a curse. 
But it does have, say that the just shall live by faith, and that's where we find our justification and sanctification. And so that's where we know um, he is doing it, and he will write the law in our hearts that says, I del delight to do thy will, O oh God. Amen. Something like that. Excellent. So to summarize what Cynthia said, do not live in the, in the twilight of Old Testament shadows. Live in the bright light of New Testament substance. Where will you live? Some of us like the shadows because you hide. No, no, no. Live in the light. Don't live in the shadows. Don't trust the shadows. And like Cynthia said, those things will only condemn you ultimately. Mm -hmm. It is a bright light of the life of Christ, having fulfilled God's law perfectly. And now God wants to give you his son. So the son would live through you. Mm -hmm. The son is not a bunch of shadows. He is the light of the world. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. The light of the world is not human religion. The light of the world is Jesus. Uh, it reminded me of 1 Corinthians 13, 12, like seeing through a glass darkly. Um, so it's uh, we receive an imperfect reflection from it. Yes. So religious practices that are viewed in this way can be misunderstood. Absolutely. Misunderstood. We're not trying to convey a secret code of secret practices. Right. We're just the pure life of Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? What is he like? That's what Christians are to bring to the world. Uh, just, just simply, uh, I was thinking if... I was standing next to a wall and I was waiting for you, Walter, to arrive <coughs> around a corner and I could see your shadow approaching before you get there. But <clears throat> if you come around the corner and you're finally there, my attention shouldn't still be on the shadow. It should be on you because you're finally there. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. I got to put that in a book or something. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Love it. Yeah. That is very, very good. You're right. It's so often Christians pay attention to the shadow, not to the person. Mm -hmm. What are we in this room paying attention to? Personality? Organization? Program? Is that what impresses us in Christian gatherings? No, no, no. Let it be the person of Jesus Christ in all his saints. That is what's impressive. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> seen in the Lord's people, seen in the preaching of the word, seen in the prayers of God's people. Let him be seen. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. Even, even, hey, how about this? Even in the privacy of your bedroom, let Christ alone be seen. Wherever you are, let him be seen. The substance of the shadow. Thank you. Okay. Question two. From verse seven, what can we say is God's number one priority? Why do animal sacrifices from a human religion designed by God himself fail to reach God's desired end? The number one priority, you might say, for God in us is our heart is right with him. So that the number one priority in us could handle the number one priority with God. His will, he wants, his will is his priority. He's going to put that in us. So God's priority from his heart to our heart. That's what he wants. From God's heart to our heart. That is the connection that really matters. Will we allow God to start the connection? By the way, He'll start it tonight if it's already not started. How? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. When you call upon his name, he saves. Mm -hmm. He will save you. When you ask Jesus Christ to truly become your Lord and Savior, no more religious fakery. You want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He will save when you call upon his name and the connection will begin. Third question. From verse 12, why could the Lord Jesus sit down, 
why couldn't the priest from Aaron's family ever sit down? Why, why couldn't the priest from Aaron's family ever sit down the tabernacle or the, or the temple? Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Why could he sit down? That sat down, right? What do you do, let's say, so to speak, when you leave your job or you're done with your job, what do you do? Like you leave, right? And then you do what? You uh -huh. get in your car. And what are you doing in your car? You're sitting, right? You're sure. sitting. <laughs> you're not standing. You're sitting. So what's happened to allow you to sit? What happened? Because thinking of your job, right? What happened? I got off work. Well, you got off work, but but what happened when you left work? You did something, right? Oh, They're painting. No. no, they. But what were you supposed to do at work? You're work. supposed to. Uh, yeah, the work is finished. The work is finished. Yes, <laughs> it's finished. <laughs> the work is finished. <laughs> when the work is finished, you can sit down. You're done. The work's finished. And so it says here that. Um, he sat down. But remember, in Hebrews 7, he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's not sitting down there. So what's going on? Why couldn't the priest uh, of Aaron's family never sit down? Because in the tabernacle, there's no chairs. There's no golden chairs there. Why not? Because the work was never finished because their, um, because their sacrifices did not finish the work. Yes, and what was the work the sacrifice was supposed to do? Uh, to reach perfection. Well, or to, to remove to sin. Yeah, to remove sin. Yeah, to to uh, to remove sins from us. So the sacrifices could never do it. So now, so they were always standing, always standing, always standing. Um, so a uh, third, fourth question from verse twenty-four: Why are love and good works? Why are love and good works? Uh, primary results we should expect from Christian fellowship. How can we provoke each other to love and good works? So why and how? What's the answer for us? Um, well, first of all, uh, I think love and good works uh, go hand in hand. And you can't have like true love of the brethren if you don't match it with your works and uh likewise you can't have truly good works or the, if you if you don't have the love that powers it um and it says in john i uh, like it says in john 15 jesus says in john 15 10 if you love me keep my or sorry 14 15 if you love me keep my commandments and it says in 15 10 if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love so it's just important to know that um, our, our good works and our love for the brethren are like, they're always come together. So why should we? It's, I think it's because, um, well, we're created for good works. And um, that's what God created us for, uh, to be a light to uh, other Others that don't know uh, God's love. Excellent. We're created for good works. How can we provoke each other? Do you have any thoughts on that? How can we uh, uh, provoke? Uh, well, later in the verse, it says to encourage one another. I think that's important. Um, mm. Another thought was to offer opportunities to one another. Like if the opportunities we give each other are just, you know, chit chat and, you know, do our nails, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I do need to clip my nails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if we, you know, like you've offered the opportunity for us to go to the park and um, evangelize, like, yeah, we were definitely spurred on the good works in that opportunity. So those are the two things I thought of. Anything to add on why for good works or how to provoke? Because as, like, as the family of God, we kind of support each other and want, we all want to be growing in our gifts and encouraging one another to uh, maybe do things we haven't done before or continue to do things that maybe we are waiting in. And I guess how would be, um, I don't know, like everyone has different gifts, so I guess if 
you want to make some type of meal that would be like an outreach or, mm. or if you're good with kids doing something like that, I guess. But I don't know. It's different for everyone. Our example, as people see our example, we do provoke them. Yes, we, we help each other. Anything to add? Love and good works. What do you think? Love and good works. Um, I think everyone has a capacity for it. Um, everyone, God's given everyone like different talents. Um, some people are better at counseling and encouraging, and some people are better for like the listening ear, like gifts. But I think um, it's important to like know yourself so that you can know the the ways that God has like given you talent so you can figure out the best ways to bless others with it. Okay. What's an example of a good work we could do for, say, Christians in the church world? What's like, just a simple thing. What, what, what do you think? Like a, a good work to do? For Christians in the church? Yeah, say if you're a part of a Christian fellowship, right? And there's people there, we see them so many times a week. What's a good work you could do for them? You can, like, Help them with cleaning. Help them with cleaning. Yes, thank you. I was just talking with a Christian recently who was doing spring cleaning in, in his home. Yes, cleaning is always needed. <laughs> thank you. What can we do? Like, what type of good works, you think? Just being an example, like towards someone in a church, or maybe, yeah, let's just say that in a church or another Christian in another church. What could we do? We'll spend time with them. Spend time with them. I like that. And so when you're spending time with them, what are you doing? Like, you're what? Like the big idea. I'm not saying playing ping pong necessarily. You play ping pong's good. You play ping pong's good. But like, what what could you be doing with them? Having a Bible study. Have Bible study. No, but you could say you could be listening to them, right? Listening to them. You know, a lot of people are lonely because people won't listen to them. Mm -hmm. There's a ministry of listening. Very important. That is a good work to listen. Because there, there's a way to minister to God's people as they unburden their heart to you. Very important. Very, very overlooked in our day of too much talk. Um, so thank you for that. And verse 25, what does it mean, last question, to forsake the gatherings of God's people? And what do Christians say as an excuse for not being a Christian fellowship? What are the consequences of not being committed to fellowship with God's people? I think forsake means forsaking uh, forsake the, forsaking the gatherings of God's people uh, means to depart from like all or much of Christian fellowship. Um, I think some sometimes also an excuse for people not being in Christian fellowships are because of grudges or wrongdoings that. Uh, mm -hmm. have occurred over the past. But those are two things I found. Um, and then some consequences uh, are that they become unaccountable mm -hmm. and then they usually drift away from the truth. Mm -hmm. So, so I know. Unaccountable and drift away from the truth. That is a bullseye. Christians become unaccountable mm -hmm. and they become under the delusion that they can run their own life. What a delusion that is. We need the help of God's people. We need the prayers of God's people. We need Lord Jesus himself through God's people to be working in us with all sorts of choices we need to make. Unaccountable and drift. That is, so you could say God's people are like an anchor for the soul. They, they anchor us to Jesus. God's people. Like, I was thinking how um, a lot of times when you're with other Christians, you're being challenged um, in your life, and how, like, also how it says the, the word of God is a uh, two edged sword, um, mm -hmm. back to the very, I forget how you say it. Um, mm -hmm. but, Cutting between soul and spirit. Yeah. Um, dividing. How, and how the word is always, should be being shared and um, that would be another way that you're being um, challenged. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. We're being challenged. So let me end our Bible study like this. I just want to end with verses 19 through 25 to wrap it up. Great sharing. 
Um, let's see. Uh, James, can uh, you be ready to read Galatians 5, verse 6 in just a minute, okay? Not yet. The Galatians 5, verse 6. So we, we, the, the last part of my outline was what now? What now do we do? We got to come back to that. What now? Verses 19 to 21. Look at the text with me because it's in the text. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he concentrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, having a high priest of the house of God. What do we do now? You use your rights and your privileges. Use what you've been given. You have been given. What are we given? Entrance into the holiest. We're given that. Use your entrance. How do you use your entrance? With boldness. Sometimes my wife brings home a sweet treat. And I'll tell you, the kids are bold to go for it. <laughs> they are bold. They are bold to go for that thing. Whoa, it's like, boom, they're right there. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> the boldness is great. How much more bold should we be to come into the holiest? Don't, don't be cowardly. Don't be double-minded. Don't be doubting. Don't be fearful. Boldness, competence. Because we have uh, a, a, a holy world, a sanctuary. We have the blood of Christ for us. We have a new and living way. That is, he himself is the way, the truth, and the life. His life, you might say, is our entrance in, 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 into the Father's presence. And he's a great priest standing for us. That's a lot of privileges. And you have rights. Will you use them or will you throw them away? Use them. And how do you use them? Three ways. Verse 22, in faith, hope, and love. Verse 22, faith, and we've talked about that we draw near in full assurance of faith. Did I say feelings? Did I say full assurance of feelings? Do your feelings change? Is there anyone in this room who uses whose feelings change? Will they be different tomorrow? Will they be not like yesterday? Here's the feelings rep, right? And trying to, I trying to do it with my hand. You, this is going up and out. That's the feelings rep. They're always changing your feelings. Full assurance of faith. That's maturity. Full assurance of faith. And so we talked about the inner life and the inner walk. So we come in by, by uh, and the outer walk. But it's faith. Second, hope. There's a confidence. It's, but we got to hold it, right? That means more than one minute. You just don't hold it on Sunday morning. Hey, everyone, here I am, you know. And you, but then what about Sunday night? What about Monday morning? What about Tuesday afternoon? Hold fast the confidence. What about when you do something wrong at work? Is the world over? When you do something wrong at work, is, is it all done? What if you go to a Christian gathering and people don't treat you well? What if you go to a Christian gathering and people don't treat you well? Oh, it, my confidence never was. No, I just throw. Why are you throwing away your confidence? Hold fast the confidence. Does it matter how people treat you? Not so much. What matters is how God treats you. He treats us the best. What matters is his faithfulness, not the faithfulness of other believers, which comes up and down. Hold fast the confidence. Third, in love. So he says here in verse 24, let us consider one another. So what does it mean to consider? Please, at the, at, at the end, kind of focus with me. Consider means like this, to examine from head to foot, to look with careful detail over everything about the person. Consider, does it mean like glance, done, glance, done? That's not what it means. It means to study, study, look at someone carefully. How do you consider God's people? Three ways. You listen to them, you observe them, and you investigate them. I mean investigate in the, in the best way, by the way. <laughs> I mean the best way. But you investigate them. Listen, observe. I don't mean spy, okay? But I mean investigate. Get to know them. So as you listen and observe, 
by the way, do you want to do that? Oh, I'm too busy. I got to run around and do this and run around and do that and run around and do this. Listen, what really matters? Remember? We talked about at the beginning, what really matters? The will of God. What is the will of God? Even your perfection. The perfection of who? Only you? I don't think so. <laughs> Praise God for you. Praise God that God's bringing you perfection. This is what's so hard for Christians. The gravitational pull of self-centeredness is very hard. Mm -hmm. What can overcome the downward gravitational pull of self-centeredness? What can overcome it? He says here, um, consider one another, and when you consider them, what do you do? To criticize them? I bet people consider me, and then they criticize me. And I'll say that person X, is it only criticism? Oh, that's all right, blah, 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 blah. No, is there anything good? When you consider people, give them a balanced picture. Mm -hmm. you got to talk about the needs, right? But some of us are really good at the needs and not so good about the remedy. you got to consider one another for what? For to stir up. Now, stir up means this. It means you may not be doing it at all, or you're in danger of stopping to do it. So the stir up is... Get it going and keep it going, right? Get it. Some Christians, they got to get going. Others, you keep them going. To stir up to love and good works. That's what really matters, love and good works. You, you, you love God's people. You love the Lord. And you do practical things to help others. And you, you love the unsaved, too. I don't mean only God's people. But uh, Galatians 6 says the emphasis, especially those who are of the household of faith. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is a manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you it, to see the day approaching. Do you know how to exhort someone? Does anyone here know how to exhort? I didn't say nag them. I didn't say whine. I didn't say accuse. What am I saying? Exhort. That word exhort comes from the idea of the Holy Spirit, who's the paraclete, who comes alongside Exhort is not just bad, bad, bad. Exhort is, hey, God is so good. Christian, live for the kingdom of God. Christian, you don't have to be addicted to that secret sin pattern. You don't have to waste your money on garbage. Dear Christian, I exhort you, love Jesus and spend your finances for the good of God's people. Not to indulge your habit. Galatians 5.6. Galatians 5.6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. What matters is faith which works by love. May our faith be working by love this week in the fellowship of God's people, whether in your home, in the meeting hall, or anywhere in between. God bless you, saints. Thank you for the time. <laughs>